Good morning, good morning, good morning, or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, welcome to the Marketing Grows Your Business show. Today, we're going to be talking about getting new customers or new clients into your business, or are we? Ah, or would it be awesome if you could have other people just tell people about you and you wouldn't have to hustle so hard to get the next client or the next customer? Hmm, wouldn't that be kind of nice? Um, and so as you're coming in, just give me a shout out. Where are you joining us from this morning? Um, I want to just give a couple of shout outs uh, to those of you as you guys come in. Um, our special guest today is going to be sharing golden nuggets with us as it relates to word of mouth marketing. I think so often we are um, chasing the next sale. And we don't always take care of our existing customers to the degree that they send more people our way. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about. If you don't have a strategy, in fact, I'd love to know how many of you have a strategy to get your customers to talk about you. And don't feel lonely if your answer is B. Like, so A is heck yes, I have a strategy to get my customers to talk about me or ooh. And the uh is no, okay? Just, <laughs> just to be totally clear. But again, as you guys are coming in, just give me a shout out. Um, good morning, Nika. Girl, how are you doing? I've been like stalking you a little bit on Facebook. I see your um, your stuff on in my Facebook feed all the time. I hope you're doing good. So Maria is saying B, like, uh, nope, I don't have that. That's okay because you're here. You're going to learn some amazing stuff today so that you can figure out how you can start to attract people to your business through word of mouth marketing. So Maria's coming at, um, to us, joining us. Good morning from DC. I hope you're good. Rita. Hello, girl. Good morning. Good morning. Lori. Good morning, Lori. I'm so glad to see you. I hope you're doing good. I've been thinking about you. Um, all right. So let me ask every one of our shows, we do giveaways. Uh, those of you who've been with me for any length of time, I see familiar faces in the comments. So, you know, the gig we give away on every show. We've been doing something kind of new and I'm excited about this. We've been like trying to find a wonderful quote that our guest speaker is known for and then creating some like swag with it. So um, today we're going to be giving away two things. One um, is the our special guest, Jay Bear's uh, latest book, Talk Triggers, which is essentially what we're talking about today. It's a complete guide to creating customers with word of mouth marketing. Um, so one winner for that. And we're going to be giving away something Jay is known for saying, give away everything you know, one bite at a time. So we designed, well, I didn't, my, my sweet amazing team designed this mug and um, one winner for that. So how do you win is the question of the day. So there's three core ways that you win. Uh, first, you share your aha moments down under. You know, Facebook doesn't like us to say that C word. I don't even know why, but I try to honor that because I don't, I want them to just share this out as much as we can, right? So the aha moment, use the hashtag aha. We'll enter you into the wheel of wow. What is an aha moment? It's like, oh, I didn't know that. Or I knew that, but I needed to hear it again. So those are what we call aha moments. Two, you can tag someone that you think needs this information, or you can sprinkle it out into the world using that S button, okay? Um, and ask questions. We love them. So every time you ask a question, you share your aha moments, you tag someone, you sprinkle it out into the world. Those are all entries into the giveaway. We put you in the wheel of wow, and um, we'll make sure that you get all those entries have more chances to win those two top those two prizes for today's show. Speaking of that, um, if you don't want to sit there with your pen and pad, which I never want anybody to, to do, um, if you would like show notes, just drop in notes into the area down under and we'll make sure that you get those. We usually try to get those out within 24 hours. Okay. So those are kind of the housekeeping things. Um, let me see. Good morning, Evelyn. I just want to give a quick shout out to a couple of people. Uh, Lori says, I love books. Who doesn't, right? 
And let's see, Paul, good morning, good morning, Paul. I'm so glad you're here. We have Allison here. We have Lisa. Girl, I've been thinking about you. I hope you're good. Uh, we have Katie from the UK. So Katie, what time is it over there right now? Um, all right, so let's, let me tell you a little bit about our special guest today. Um, our special guest is my sweet friend. We've I've known Jay for, I don't even know, gosh, a long time. Uh, I don't even remember where we met the first time, but he um, is has had many facets of his businesses uh, business over the years. But currently, he helps businesses clone their customers, which is like hello, right? Who doesn't want that? He's a seventh generation entrepreneur. He has written six best selling books wowzers, right? And founded five multi-million dollar companies. He's one of the world's top 30 global gurus in customer service and online marketing and is a Hall of Fame speak, keynote speaker. Uh, Jay has helped many of the world's most iconic brands like uh, the United Nations, Oracle, Hilton, and U.S. Bank exceed their customer ex uh, uh, customers' expectations. That did not want to roll off my tongue this morning. He is a lover of plaid suits, and I'm going to tell you right off the bat, he is dressed for success this morning. You wait until you see him. And uh, he is a licensed tequila consultant and a certified barbecue judge. Yeah, like that's super fun. We might need to ask him about that. So, guys, put your hands together for Jay Bear. Hey, Jer. Jay. Hello, Kim. How you doing? Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. Really excited to have this conversation. Thanks for the awesome coffee mug, too. I didn't know you were going to do that. Please send me one. I, I love Absolutely. To, uh, I like to show that to my wife. Look at this smart thing I said. So, so just so you know, like uh, we were going, I was going through questions this morning, just doing the review and I'm like, Okay, you said something in your book that I'm like, it's such a good t-shirt. So I'm telling you, this is a marketing tip for you. Okay, you. you need a t-shirt that says this. And if I had thought of it before, I would have definitely created this saying <laughs> versus the one I chose. Same as lame. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, that's a t-shirt for sure. Yes. So do y'all agree? Like same as lame is amazing t-shirt. It's a Jay Bear uh, quote. Um, I was like, man, I wish I'd have thought of, I'd seen that one first, but still. You need a line of, of sayings. <laughs> I need a merch table at the back. Yes, of you seat. do. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I was just going to ask the audience just real quick, um, because this is a something I've heard you say quite frequently in several interviews. And I just kind of want, before we get started, I want to give, um, kind of get everybody's, uh, a, a paint a picture of the possibles with customer, um, or word of mouth marketing. Mm -hmm. So I want you guys to answer this question. Blank and and 91%. So this is a range, okay? So uh, of all purchases are influenced by word of mouth marketing. So what percentage and 91% of all purchases are influenced by word of mouth marketing? So you, you guys pop that in. If you think about it, like in the context of 91%, hmm, that's a lot, right? So I'm just curious what everybody thinks, because um, I've heard you say it. I heard it in several of the interviews that you uh, you gave. So we'll give everybody an opportunity to answer that question. But anyway, before I always like to give people like kind of a bit of your backstory, um, because you didn't just plop down and and be who you are today. You have this, you know, I think sometimes people look at where you are instead of how the journey. So I know it's been a long and, and very journey, but kind of just give us a little synopsis of how where you started and how you've gotten to where you are today. I started in politics. I was a political campaign consultant and, and helped run elections for, for Congress and governor and Senate and president even. Uh, I did that for a while and then realized, wow, that business is uh, sort of terrifying and terrible. So I got out of politics and got into what we would now consider to be traditional marketing. I worked for uh, a couple of large companies for a brief period of time. I worked for the government uh, as a spokesperson for about 10 minutes. I realized that government was not really the a working environment that suited my entrepreneurial nature. I uh, started my own uh, company and and had a, a, a marketing services strategy firm, sold it, started another one, uh, Convince and Convert 13 years ago, which I sold last year. Uh, and, and here we are. So it's it's interesting. Uh, in some ways, I've been doing this forever, but, but in different 
uh, ways. I actually started in online marketing in 1993 uh, before you even had to pay for domain names. When I started, there wasn't even a browser and you could get any domain name you wanted and pay nothing for it. And Kim, I think I've told you this story. My partners and I, in my very first internet company, circa 1993, which is now, Jesus, 30 years ago, uh, we had the domain name Budweiser.com. And Anheuser-Busch, who owns Budweiser Beer, called us and said, hey, we want to have the first ever website for Budweiser Beer. It says that, that you own the, the name Budweiser.com. And we said, yes, we do. And so we'd like to have it. Well, that's great, but we're not just going to give it to you. We're not fools. And so we negotiated back and forth and forward and backwards and lawyers. And, and we ended up selling Budweiser.com to Anheuser-Busch in 1993 for $50 cases of beer. 50 cases of beer was the price uh, for uh, the domain name. Now, I will tell you. <laughs> that is uh, such a fabulous story. I have not heard that story before. Totally true. 100% <laughs> true. Uh, I will tell you, though, in, in my defense, right, we it was literally written in the contract, bottles, not cans, because you got to keep it classy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, that is such a fabulous story. <laughs> you know, those of us who go back, like, you know, now that we're saying it, because I started in 1991, and uh, that was when I, but of course, then to your point, there was no browsers, there was no Nothing. information. We Nothing. were like winging it, like literally, like trying to figure it out as we went. Um, and many iterations of businesses over the years, you know, we've just, you've done it. I've definitely done it. Um, so when it comes to word of mouth marketing, in a nutshell, what in the world does that mean anyway? Typically, it's it's creating demand or direct sales through a recommendation or referral from a previous customer. And actually word of mouth is, is the best way to grow any business. I mean, it isn't it true that the best way to grow a business is for your customers to do it for you. And this has actually been true since the first caveman sold an arrowhead to another caveman, like, wow, Grog's got the best arrowheads, get them from him. Uh, what's great about word of mouth is it allows you to grow your business without spending a lot of money on, on advertising and proactive uh, sales and marketing. In fact, Kim, one of my favorite quotes uh, in, in the history of business, and it's, it's not from me, so uh, we can't make it a coffee mug. It's from Robert Stevens, who's the, the founder of Geek Squad, the services arm of Best Buy. Robert once said that advertising is a tax paid by the unremarkable. Advertising is a tax paid by the unremarkable. Now, there is clearly a time and a place for advertising. Most of the folks tuning in today advertise uh, here or there. I certainly do. Kim does as well. There's a time and a place for it. But it is also true that many of the most successful businesses in the world advertise the least. How is that possible? Wouldn't you think that those who advertise the most would make the most money? Typically not the case. They can afford to advertise very little because their customers do the job of advertising for them. That's the power of word of mouth. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. most companies do it wrong, which is why I wrote a whole book about it. Yes. Um, I, and most to you, I, you know, that was one of your points, too, is most businesses don't have a strategy to to get their customers talking about them, uh, which is, you know, when, what I really want to get uh, to. One, I wanted to go back uh, and, and answer uh, the uh, question that I posed earlier, the, the, the percentages, the range of percentages on, you know, how many people actually make a purchase based on um, word of mouth marketing. And the fill in the blank answer was like 51%. So yep. if over half of people, um, or more make buying decisions today based off of word of mouth marketing. Um, you know, and I have, I bet you do too, Jay, that you have your favorite people that you follow. And anytime they say, oh, you know, I love this backpack or I love this makeup or, you know, whatever, you're Absolutely. like, Amazon, here I come, you know? So and even if it's people that you don't know, one of the interesting things coming out of the pandemic um, is that, 70% of consumers say that they rely upon ratings and reviews more than ever. 
Mm, because things are all kind of topsy-turvy and mixed up because of the pandemic. Like, is this place even open? Um, Are they COVID safe? Do they even have spare ribs anymore? Like nobody really knows what's up anymore. It's all very confusing. And and so if you can rely on Google reviews, Yelp reviews, TripAdvisor reviews, whatever reviews uh, to give you that little hint about whether this place is great or terrible, uh, why would you not do that? Like very few people have enough money that they don't care uh, what anybody else thinks about the business. And, and so our reliance upon ratings and reviews before we make purchases is at an all-time high. And, and what is a rating or a review? Yeah. It's word and of so, mouth with shelf life. That's all it, it is. It's it, word it, of mouth with shelf life. That's such a great point because you're right. If we go to Amazon and we're looking for, I don't know, fill in the blank, right? A, a new vacuum cleaner. Um, and we're like Googling or, you know, looking the re- we look at the reviews um, to see if one, if so other people have liked it. And we don't know those people from Adam. Like we don't know, no. like, you know, Tom from wherever or Susie or, you know, whoever they are. We don't know those people, but we trust that they've given a factual um you know, they're sharing their experience yes. uh, with that product. So that's, I love that you said that. That's another quotable moment that could be a t-shirt, I'm just saying, or a mug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got a million of them. I know, right? I trained myself for speaking of tweets a long time yes. ago. Yes. So you guys, um, I have, I just want to ask a quick question. See this, this little orange um, flower that Jay has on mm-hmm. his lapel mm-hmm. here. So do you think it squirts water? Okay. I wish it squirted tequila, uh, but it doesn't. Oh, it doesn't squirt okay. anything. But I do have so a million good. of them. I've got like 30 <laughs> of these flowers. <laughs> so I just thought that was super cute. Because okay, I hate pocket squares, right? So yes. I hate pocket squares because I can't fold them right. And I've tried and tried. And I just, I don't know. And then the other thing about pocket squares is I tend to lose them. Uh-huh. Um, and so I've got tons of these and they just stay on the jacket. Yes. I take them off to go to the dry cleaner on occasion, but they stay on. So you get the same kind of effect as a pocket square, the same kind of like pop of color, but it's just way easier to deal with when you're traveling all the time. Yeah. So um, Lori made a great point. And I just wanted to make a question uh, out of it real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, she say, she says, I know some people are hired to give bad reviews. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of the platforms these days, like Amazon, for example, you you have to have a real account there. Um, you yes. know, you have to be a re- you have to do some verification in order to get to be able to leave a review. Has that is that something that the you know the review sites have managed to master so that people can't manipulate the system? I'd love your take on that. Um, a couple things. One, uh, Daniel Lemon, who co-wrote Talk Triggers with me, is a dear friend. Uh, and is now the co-host of the Social Pros podcast, which I hosted for 10 years. Uh, He wrote a book a few years ago called Manipurated. um, And it's all about that, that that some ratings and reviews can be fraudulent. Since he wrote that book, um, you're right, Kim, a lot of technology has been put into place to verify reviews. And so you see things on a lot of different review sites, verified purchaser, et cetera, which has cut down on some of that. Now, like anything else, buyer beware. And and that's why it certainly is a good idea to check multiple reviews and not take any individual perspective and, and give it too much uh, credence. On the whole, um, it is generally true that I think most reviews and most scores turn out to be generally accurate. I think we would uh, agree with that. But are there incidences of fraud? Of course. Um, the same way that even if it wasn't on a review, if you have a if you have a barber and that barber wants to make sure the barber next door doesn't get as many haircuts, he could just tell his customers, talk about it in the community that they cut bad hair. So um, it's, it's a story as old as business itself. But um, I, I wouldn't shy away from what they call the wisdom of crowds uh, because there are a few bad apples out there. Yeah. I mean, another, I think like on Amazon and places like that, you know, the trust factor for those platforms is pretty good just because it's a mass, mass place. But, you know, we, I, I'll share this real quick because I don't want to deviate too far down in this trail. But um, my friend Shalene Johnson just recently had an experience with a, um, a plastic surgeon. And through that experience, she found out that there is a very easy, a lot of these doctors are manipulating the review 
places. You know, they have a process for being able to do that. So, you know, like if you're buying a vacuum cleaner, you can probably you could probably trust the reviews on Amazon. But yeah. if you're going for you know a medical procedure, dig deeper. You know, yes. <laughs> I guess it's a moral to the story. Absolutely. Okay, so digging into your book a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, the name of the um, book is Talk Triggers. Mm -hmm. So uh, before as we break this down, what is a talk trigger as it relates to word of mouth marketing? A talk trigger is an operational choice that you make in your business that is designed to create conversations. An operational choice designed to create conversations. Because the problem with word of mouth, Kim, and the, and the reason why most businesses do it wrong, and this has been true you know, for centuries, um, is that we just take it for granted. Here's a crazy stat. Fewer than 1% of all businesses have an actual word of mouth strategy. Now, I don't think it's it's uh, crazy to suggest that most of us here understand that word of mouth is important, but we don't have a strategy for it. And that's so strange because we've got a strategy for everything else. You've got a social media strategy, a PR strategy, a hiring strategy, a sales strategy, a pricing strategy, car wash strategy, you get a strategy for everything. But the one thing you don't have a strategy for most likely is word of mouth. Uh, we just take it for granted. We just assume that if we run a good business, customers will naturally notice that and talk about it. But it's not true. And here's the quote. Competency does not create conversations. Competency does not create conversations. It is, of course, important to run a competent business. That's what keeps your customers. That's what prevents churn and defection. But we don't talk about competency. We talk about something that is outside of our expectations. Hey, let me tell you about this experience I had last night. It was perfectly adequate said nobody ever because it's not a story. So a talk trigger is a story that you feed your customers that they then pass along to the next generation of customers. Oh, so good. So you're so right. Like, you know, if we go to a movie and it's just okay, you don't run out and tell people about it. Or if you go to a restaurant and your meal is use your word adequate. I mean, it's not horrible, but it's not amazing. You don't tell people about it either. This is why so. you almost never see three-star reviews. Yeah. Right. If you look at any sort of review portal, there's very few three-star reviews because what's the point of writing it? Yeah. Yeah. I got spaghetti. It's pretty much what I expected. I think it three stars. On. Like there's no yeah. point to it. Right. right so right, that's why it tends right. to be ones and fives. I was just getting ready to say exactly what you just said, where it's, it, if you are seriously not happy, you, you, like you run to give yeah, a review you're warning you're warning people yes and then if you're super happy you give you give a review too so it's like yes. one end of the spectrum or or the other so if you find somebody that's got a three star three star um median range that means a lot of people were unhappy in it and some people were happy <laughs> just Generally averaged good. out yeah. so um in your book uh you discuss five talk uh trigger types yes can you break those down sure uh, there's five different ways to create customer conversations with an operational differentiator. And I think it's important to understand that a talk trigger is really customer experience. It's not marketing. It's a customer experience component that creates big marketing advantages, but it's not marketing in the classic sense. It's not a price. It's not a promotion. Um, and it's also important to understand that a talk trigger is something that creates word of mouth for your business every day. It's not a viral stunt. It's not a, a big annual contest and promotion. It's, it's something that's intended to create conversations all the time. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the five types of talk triggers is talk about generosity. This is when you give your customer more than they expect and anticipate. One of the most famous versions of this kind of talk trigger is Doubletree Hotels. Doubletree Hotels is a Hilton brand, uh, as some of you may know. When you go to the Doubletree Hotel, they give you a warm chocolate chip cookie when you check in. Each of the Doubletree Hotels has an oven in it, and they make the cookies right there. When you check in, they give you a hot cookie, put it in a paper sleeve, and hand it to you. It's a pretty darn good cookie. Before the pandemic, when they were fully loaded, Doubletree was distributing 75,000 cookies a day. A day. Now, Hilton is a client of mine, and they participated with us in the research for the book. So we were able to do a study of Hilton customers, Doubletree customers, to gauge how important this talk trigger is. Turns out, Kim, a third of their guests, 33%, 
have told somebody else a story specifically about that cookie. So if you do the math on that, that's 25,000 stories a day about a chocolate chip cookie, which is one of the reasons why Doubletree spends less on advertising than any other hotel chain in that price point because the cookie is the ad, the guests are the sales and marketing department. Now, what's fascinating about this, and this is, I think, an important lesson about talk triggers, is it's not necessarily part and parcel of their regular business, right? It's not about the comfortable bed or room service or free HBO or what a nice smelly soap on the counter in the bathroom. It's a chocolate chip cookie, right? So that's when we say a talk trigger is an operational choice that you make that's designed to create conversation. So talk about generosity uh, is, is the first type. Well, I was just going to uh, say, but it's, it is a good cookie. It like, is for sure. It's, it's no like, question. You, I mean, I, we, I mean, if it was a crappy uh, cookie, it probably wouldn't work as well. Yes. No I mean, that's another point. Like, you know, when it comes to generosity, don't, don't, I mean, it's, you know, and if you think about it, the cost of the cookie versus the amount of goodwill that they, and, and all of this, the 25,000 stories a day based on their cookie is there's no amount of money that they could spend that they could throw at advertising to create that kind of, a, of, of goodwill, if you will. Right. Yep. I mean, it'd be almost impossible. Yes. Um, so, you know, and that doesn't cost them that much money, no. um, but it needs to be exceptional, whatever. Yeah, it needs to be is. consistent, right? The key and, is that yes. it's, it's, it's every day, every hotel, every time it's not, you know, and this is critical for talk triggers. It's not, once in a while, it's not just your new customers. It's not only your best customers. It's all the customers every time. It's a consistent thing, right? Yes. So I'm just curious, like obviously brick and mortar businesses, um, you know, somebody walking in their door, it's a little mm -hmm. easier for online businesses who don't physically get to see their customers or their clients, um, their buyers. Um, what is some good strategies from a generosity perspective uh, that they could leverage? Well, it, it all works the same, right? So, so you can, for example, I, I am a, um, a digital business for the most part. Uh, my talk trigger uh, is one that's uh, talk about attitude. Okay. Talk about attitude is one of the five uh, types um, talk about attitude is when you just do something a little bit irreverent or unusual or kind of wacky or weird. So the way it works for me is that every time somebody uh, books me to give a, a keynote presentation or an MC host role uh, at an event, either live or, or uh, virtually, they go to a special website. It's dressjbear.com and they get to pick out which suit I will wear on camera or on stage. I have 14 different plaid suits in a variety of colors. They go to the website, they get to pick out. So the meeting planner, who's actually my, my customer, who I've never met face-to-face, -face, gets to make this selection, which they then remember, tell their friends who are also meeting planners, and it creates the next generation of word of mouth uh, for me. So it doesn't have to be uh, a physical business. It can be a virtual business as well. And it can even be... Um, uh, something that kind of lives in between. So one of the other types of talk triggers is talkable speed. This is when you're just faster uh, than your customers expect. There's a small business, an accounting firm in Indianapolis, not too far from me, called Bognadoff and Dodges. And they're a small accounting firm. They're not very noteworthy. They do taxes and they do some tax advice. And there's two principals, Paul and Tim, and they've got a, an associate and a front desk person. And, and, you know, it, like it's an accounting firm, like, but it's not really a secret sauce there, but they understand word of mouth and they understand how to create word of mouth, even in what you might think is kind of a boring business, like a tax business. Every time they get a contact from a client phone or email, they respond within five minutes, five minute response time from an accounting firm. Now, this is very unusual, uh, and it creates a lot of word of mouth. Number one, if you go to Google, you'll see that this accounting firm has dozens and dozens and dozens of reviews, which is weird because I've had a lot of accountants in my day, and I've never even thought about leaving a Google review because that just seems weird. So they've got lots of reviews, and almost every single one of their reviews specifically mentions how fast and responsive they are. So it can actually work 
uh, in, in any business. You just have to make it work. Yeah. And you have to come up with that like unique value proposition yeah. that shows yeah. you, you know, you have an ex exceptional fill in the blank, right? Exactly. One of uh, the things that we've started to implement and we've just started to do it and it's not, we've, we're just, we've just got to get some uh, consistency, which was one of your points is just sending, um, you know, a, a customized, um, we were using Bonjuro for this customized uh, video, you know, for any buyers that come our way, you know, just letting them know, Hey, I saw, you know, I saw you bought whatever. And, you know, having that uh, mm -hmm. email go out as a personal touch. Um, and that's just something we've just started to do. Again, what would that look like for everybody else? That's up, up to you. You know, what can you support? Yes. You might not be able to do a five minute, you know, uh, you know, be right on top of something, you know, from a customer service perspective. But there may be other things that you could do that would get your your customers talking about you. Um, you know, a lot of people use a, a shock and all kind of things, you know, uh, boxes, gifts, you know, whatever, uh, depending on the 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 type of buyer, um, which gives me, you know, you mentioned this a minute ago, but I wanted to, to dig into it a little bit more. We've been talking about brick and mortar businesses. You gave us some examples. We talked about some online things, but are there um, certain types of businesses that you think or niches, if you will, that can do this better than others? Or do you think it's, it's a one size fits all um, in the context of, you know, anybody can do this kind of thing? Anybody can do it. Um, and I've done it for lots and lots of businesses as a consultant. And of course, many, many, many people who have read the book. And there's a Facebook group for readers of the book who go in and talk about ideas and help each other. We've got a, a cohort, a training program. And, and so I've seen it work in almost every industry. I will say this, though, Kim. Um, it is typically easier for smaller companies to implement a talk trigger because they just have fewer operational hurdles and stakeholders to kind of align inside the organization. So if you are a, a single location business and you wanted to give away a warm chocolate, let's say um, I took my dog to the groomer today. Let's say you're a, a dog groomer and you wanted to give away warm chocolate chip cookies to everybody who dropped off their dog. Not a terrible idea. Um, you could get a cookie baking oven in your dog groomer place fairly easily. But if you're Doubletree and you have literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hotels all over the world, to supply chain that is a little more complicated, right? So um, it, is, it is typically easier for smaller businesses to execute just because they can see all the different parts of the business um, easier, if that makes sense absolutely does you know uh, for those of us who've worked with bigger brands you know this to be true the red tape sometimes is immense you know getting i once worked with this brand who's you know they were um you know they were a large financial services company but just simple things like getting them to install Google Analytics took six months to get approved. I mean, it was like crazy, yeah. like yeah. ridiculous how, um, you know, how many people have to agree and, you know, it goes through a process. So I would agree wholeheartedly. And, with and sometimes that. big companies don't want to do something interesting because they yes. feel like it's risky, right? They're like, yeah. hey, we're already a big company. So to do something unusual. Uh, yeah. it creates some measure of risk, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to, uh, I want to just briefly touch on the, on the other two types of talk triggers, because there are five. And I, and I talked about, uh, talkable generosity, uh, talkable attitude, which is my suit thing, talkable speed, bogging off and dodges, uh, talkable usefulness is, is one of the other ways when you're just more useful as a business than customers expect. One of my favorite examples of that one is, uh, Berea pasta. We're probably all familiar with that brand, dried pasta. You get it in the supermarkets. Here's the problem with making pasta. Okay, Kim, you'll back me up on this. Pasta is awesome if you cook it perfectly. It gets way less awesome if you cook it just a little under or a little over, right? Like we all have experienced that. The other tricky thing about pasta is depending on the shape of the noodle, spaghetti or rigatoni or penne or whatever, um, the time it requires to cook is slightly different because you get different density of the noodle, blah, blah, blah. Well, Berea Pasta uh, has struggled with this for a long time and their customers are always complaining in social media. So they came up with one of my favorite talk triggers ever. They just came out last year. Uh, it's a series of Spotify playlists. So you go on Spotify and based on what kind of Berea pasta you're cooking, let's say it's penne, you go to the penne playlist on Spotify. 
you boil your water, water is boiling, you dump the pasta in and you hit play on the playlist. And it's a bunch of uh, kind of awesome Italian opera songs and kind of, it's all very Italian stuff. And the second that particular playlist is over, you take the pasta out of the water and it's done perfectly. So there's a different playlist because it's a different length with different songs for each type of pasta. I love that idea. And now they're starting to promote it in their packaging and all that. It's awesome. That is stinking brilliant. Talk about creative. I mean, and that's, again, looking at this through that creative lens. If you are a creative person, what could you do? I mean, the cookie might work for you. Absolutely. Depending on what kind of business, if you, especially if you have a, a brick and mortar yes. business. But how could you be, get creative? Like, that's super creative. Well, and it, um, and it solves an obvious problem, right? It's like, yes. oh, yeah, we can fix this. Um, go ahead. You know, I, I was going to ask this question because... I, I have seen this myself, like sometimes when you do the what I would say are maybe expected or what everybody else is doing, you don't get your customers talking about it. So yeah. like it's like you send them like, you know, a, a gift in the mail, like, you know, like I give them, you know, my mastermind students mm -hmm. get this little you know thing, right? It's yep. not enough of a value proposition in their heads that they're like, wow, I mean, it's not that they don't value it or they don't think it's awesome, but like getting them to share it in social, mm -hmm. what is, what is that defining line? What yeah. makes people share, you know, and talk about you? Yeah, it's, in that I, I have the answer. Uh, it's, it has to be something that they don't expect. All human beings, all human beings, all around the world, all types of uh, countries, companies, people, it does not matter. Everybody is wired in their head the same way. Okay. We are wired physiologically to discuss things that are different and ignore things that are the same. So it's not that the, that the notebooks that you're sending to mastermind members aren't nice. They're delightful. But it's not like, I can't believe I got this notebook. People have seen notebooks before. Um, and maybe it's even the nicest notebook they've ever gotten. It may be the best chocolate chip cookie you've ever gotten from a hotel either. The reason it works is because it's a chocolate chip cookie that you don't usually get from a hotel, right? So it has to be something different. It's not necessarily about quality. That's the big mistake people make. They're like, well, what we'll do is we'll just send something that's nicer and that'll get them talking. No, it has to. it would have to be so over the top nice to get them talking, um, that you're better off sending them something totally different, right? You're better off sending them an Etch-a-Sketch than a notebook because they don't expect an Etch-a-Sketch, right? So it's got to be something that they don't expect. And in fact, in the book, which includes, we won't have time for it today, but in the book, uh, it includes a six-step process for exactly how to create and implement a talk trigger in your own business. It's the same process we use in our consulting firm. Um, in the process we ask you to interview a bunch of your customers and ask them what they expect in different parts of your business. And then what you do is create an expectations map. And then your talk trigger needs to be in a place that they don't expect. It has to be something like, oh, I didn't see that coming, right? So pasta playlist, like you didn't see that coming. And that's why it's talkable. Good. So I once got, um, I hired this agency at one time and that what they sent me was so unusual. I'd never seen it uh, before. So it was like, you know, it, it had to do with their location. So it was a series of, um, chocolates, like they were based in uh, Austin, Texas. So they had like a, uh, a boot and, uh, you know, it was like four little chocolates, but they were all like Lone Star, like a Lone Star and, you know, a little boot and maybe a cowboy hat. I don't know. But again, that's an unexpected yep. thing. And so, yes, it's unusual. And I was like, that is so cool uh, versus a T-shirt or, you know, mug or whatever. Hmm. Yep. So this is this is fascinating. Um so for people who want to do this, like, but they're still unsure, like, could you share like maybe two or three strategies about how they could get started with word of mouth marketing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the first thing to think about is what do people say about you now? Because your talk trigger, whatever it ends up being, has to fit 
the culture and the DNA of you and your business, right? So if it's completely out of bounds, people are like, this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't add up psychologically. Um, so what we call that in the book is, is relevance, right? Your talk trigger has to be relevant to your larger brand positioning, your kind of shtick, right? So uh, I tend to be a little bit irreverent uh, on stage when I do presentations. I use a handheld microphone, like a stand-up comic. There's a lot of humor in my presentations, et cetera. So, so kind of plaid suits, you get to pick it out. Like all of that makes sense mm -hmm. in the context of who I am and what I do. Um, so you don't want it to just be random. So for example, uh, people are like, well, what we'll do is, um, hey, we're just going to rent an elephant, right? And we'll put our logo on the side of the elephant and we'll walk it down Main Street. Well, people will talk about that for sure, but they won't talk about your business. They'll be like, why is an elephant? I don't understand. Why is it an elephant? I don't get it. I don't get it. Why is it an elephant? So that's not conversation that builds your business. It's conversation. People are like, I don't understand what you're talking about, right? So it has to make sense. So that's the first thing you want to do is is either look at your existing ratings and reviews or interview customers or whatever you need to do to get some some um, some data and and what is kind of the party line about you now so pasta is a good example right so berea did that analysis and realized that people said we love the pasta the problem is sometimes we don't make it right and it sucks right that was the that was the core insight and so you want to do the same thing in your business because once you have um, that kind of initial uh, inkling, then usually what you can do is accentuate, double down, magnify that, and, and then that becomes uh, the talk trigger. So for example, there's a business in um, Los Angeles called La Boucherie. It's a very famous, um, very fancy steakhouse uh, on the top floor of the Standard Hotel, which is the law, uh, tallest building in LA. Uh, incredible views of the entire Los Angeles basin. Um, really, really known for a high level of customer service. That was sort of the initial uh, notion. Like, yeah, people people really, in a town that has a lot of places with good customer service, they're known for customer service. Like, yeah, cool, but that's not really a talk trigger, right? Because how do you even define or dimensionalize customer service? Customer service is more of a feeling in many cases. And so they're like, we need to put a finer point on this idea. So what they have now at La Boucherie is a steak knife menu. So you go in, uh, you order a steak. They have a steak knife maitre d' sommelier person who comes to your table and says, uh, Ms. Garris, welcome very much, and opens up like this walnut case that's velvet lined. And in this case are 11 different types of steak knives lined up. Skinny French ones, big Australian ones, everything in between, bone handled, ceramic ones from Japan, like the whole gamut of steak knives. And they let you pick. And of course it's very beautiful, the box. And so people put it on Instagram all the time and, and it creates word of mouth for the restaurant. So they already had the kind of key idea, which is we're really known for customer service, but then you just want to put a finer point on it as, uh, as they did. Such a great idea. Again, just being clever as somebody, um, Allison says, cleverly relevant or cleverly creative, even I would say. Um, and we had a great question here um, from Lori. She's like, what if people don't have people yet? In other words, they're just right. getting started. They don't have customers yet. Yeah. You know, what did they do if nobody's yeah. saying anything yet? Such a great question. Yes, absolutely. Especially for new businesses. I get this a lot. I'm just, hey, we're starting up a company. So we don't have any customers. Everybody ask. So what you want to do then is go out and interview who you would like your customers to be, right? So so go go do six or eight phone calls with the type of people who you would like your customers to be and then walk through your process. So you'd have a, a phone interview, something like this. When you come to our website, what would you expect to happen? When you place an order, what would you expect to happen? When you receive your item, what would you expect to happen? When you call in for customer service, what would you expect to happen? Ask them what they would expect and then do something different than that. So that's the unexpected um, piece of it. You know, yeah. if they expect to get a certain thing, such that's a great yeah, story. Because, um, so somebody asked me the other day, well, what if, uh, you know, we're, we're like a consulting firm, consulting uh -huh. firm asked me. Well, what could we do? I'm like, well, there's a lot of things, but I said, you know, what's what's a key part of the of the customer journey in consulting? Well, when you create and deliver a proposal, here's what we say we're going to do for you. Here's what's going to cost. It's a big part of the thing, right? 
Well, 99% of the time, consulting firm makes a proposal, saves it as a PDF, emails it and says, open, read it and we'll follow up with you, right? Right. And so that's, said, that's not the way you do it, according to, what is that guy, the, the negotiator, the book? I can't think of the name of the book off the top of my head. But anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. So, so what I uh, recommended to this, uh, this uh, person in my, in my cohort was, all right, what if you printed the proposal using an actual printer? I know, old school. And you put it in a plastic envelope. And then you went to your local grocery store um, and you bought a sheet cake and you had the grocery mm. store bakery decorate the sheet cake with frosting so that it looks like the cover page of your proposal. And of course they can do that. Yeah. You put the proposal itself in the plastic envelope underneath the cake. And then you have the cake delivered to your prospective customer. Again, this would only work in a local scenario. Yeah. So knock, knock, knock. Um, yes, here's a cake from Convince and Convert. Uh, and you're like, what do we do with this? And they eat the cake and the proposal is inside the cake. Now, yes. would they remember that? Yes, they, yes, they would. So along the, I had a, I had a job opening one time uh, and uh, one of the uh, people who you know, wanted an interview sent a pizza, ordered a pizza, the, the pizza came um, and inside of the box, you know, when you flipped up and flipped it open, uh, it said, you need to hire me. And mm -hmm. did we hire her? Of course we did, of because course. what an amazing way to stand out uh, in a unique way. So those are again, that's an unexpected um, opportunity. That is so clever. I never thought about a cake, though, in that context. Usually we just try to get people back on the phone and st <laughs> <laughs> you know, back on See? Zoom. There so you go. Such there a you better go. approach. Yes, yes, yes. OK, interesting. Um, so well, the last one we didn't talk about, talk about yeah. empathy. Um, yeah, that's yes, yes, let's do empathy. Um, th this one probably wouldn't have made the book mm, three, four years ago. Um, I am a seventh generation entrepreneur. As I think you mentioned in the introduction, my son is an eighth generation entrepreneur. He has a fashion business. My family has been self-employed since like the 1850s or something. Um, and the number of times I had a conversation with my dad or my grandfather about treating customers with dignity and respect and kindness and humanity and empathy, literally zero times in my whole life, never, because I'm old enough to remember Kim as as well. And some of you maybe too, that was just the default setting. That's how we treated all customers. We didn't have a name for it. Nobody was writing books about empathy because it was like, that was just kind of how you did it. And then somewhere along the way, we kind of lost our way and, and we find ourselves where we are here, which is in an era of empathy deficit. Today in business, in life, certainly in politics, treating one another with kindness and respect and dignity and humanity and empathy is, is no longer the default setting. And that makes me a little sad as a human being. But as a business consultant, I will tell you, it's a huge opportunity for you because now when you treat your customers disproportionately well, they notice it and they talk about it. And they didn't used to because they expected it. Remember, word of mouth is about the unexpected. People don't expect great customer service. So today, when you deliver it, they're like, holy cow. Here's an example. You're probably familiar with this brand, Chewy.com, the, the online pet supply uh, company. Look, people have been trying to do pet supplies online uh, for 20 years, almost always unsuccessfully. Chewy has added $800 million in revenue, up 800, not, not 800 total, up 800 million in the last year and a half. Now, part of that's pandemic and pets and all that, but they're killing everybody else in the industry. And it's not because they've got better dog food or meaningfully better prices. It's because they have genuinely better customer service. They're the organization who all the time somebody writes in and says, hey, unfortunately, my dog just passed away. I've got an unopened bag of dog food. Do you want me to send it back? Chewy says, no, do donate it to a local shelter. The next morning, customer hears a knock on the door. It's FedEx. FedEx has an oil painting of their dog that Chewy's in-house oil painting artist made. Really sorry. Condolences. We're here for you, Chewy. Now, is that person ever going to buy pet supplies from anybody else? No. Seriously. And will they tell literally every person they meet? Of course. Yes. yes. I've heard similar stories um, uh, and other, other types of like 
value propositions that they bring uh, to their customer base. And that's incredible. I mean, you know, a, a pet is our chill. They're our children. Like they're not like just like, I mean, even on a higher level in some ways, just from an emotional perspective, because they give us so much unconditional love, you know? So, you know, when somebody does that and honors them in such a way, you're right. They're never going to forget that. Yep. Well, let's, let's start wrapping up. I value your time and everyone else's. So, um, I would like to ask this question, um, and as we like again kind of close things up, um, what is a question that I should have asked but didn't, as it relates to word of mouth marketing? Um, one that I get a lot that you didn't ask is what happens if um, somebody copies my talk figure, right? So my competitors uh, try and steal it, and that can happen but it usually doesn't because if you're successful at putting it out there, if somebody tries to copy it, then people are gonna realize that there's a copycat uh, and, and then they don't actually get the same kind of word of mouth benefit. What is more likely to happen is that your talk trigger is so successful that customers now begin to um, expect it and then they don't talk about it as much because they just know it's how you do business or the world changes. Uh, and the talk trigger is no longer relevant. So you may you may know Kim um, Enterprise Rent a Car. Do you know what their talk trigger was for years and years and years? There's no, slogan? I don't know. I'm curious. We'll, we'll pick you up. We'll oh, pick that's you right. Up. Yes. Yeah. So so Enterprise Rent a Car was the only business where they would they would come to your house, pick yes. you up, take you to the rental car, vice versa. They would kind of carry you around, and that was a pretty good talk trigger and and very uh, and very different uh, until Uber. Once Uber came along and I could click a button on my phone and I could get a ride anywhere at any time, why do I care about the rental car kid dropping me off? Like, who cares, right? So th their strategy and their positioning and their talk trigger has changed now because it just isn't relevant anymore. The world has changed. And that, and that can yeah. occasionally happen. But Doubletree, for example, the cookie, 31 years. 30 yeah. wow. years they've been doing this. And, and why, I mean, it's still working very well for them. You know, going back to something you said a minute ago about, you know, how we've kind of lost our way, you know, brick and mortar businesses, we used to have to survive off of, you know, the goodwill of our customers yeah. and we knew we had to treat right. them well. And I think the internet and social media as a whole kind of, you know, it opened up um, or, and made us feel like that we didn't have to do a lot of the stuff that we we traditionally did because who was, you know, it wasn't as, even though a lot of people still are talking about things, bad customer service and stuff like that. But I, I think to your point, we have lost our way with how do we really love up our existing customer base um, and, you know, find a, our talk trigger so that we can, you know, give that that value, additional value so that people will um, want to share and talk about us. And, and it will make you money. Like if you do yes. this right, this is going to make you uh, money. Like there, there's so much um, emphasis right now on influencer marketing. And, and I get it. Like I'm not anti-influencer marketing. I, I am an influencer. I run a lot of influencer programs. My daughter works for an influencer marketing software company. Like I'm all in on that. But I will tell you this. If you have an effective talk trigger, every single customer is a potential influencer. Mm -hmm. All you've got to do is unlock their word of mouth. Mm -hmm. You've got to give them a story to tell. And the story is not, yep, it's pretty good business. No one talks about that because it's not interesting. Well, it's so funny. I I, um, I have one of my um, several of I got this new program called Design to Scale, and mm -hmm. um, my I'm getting referrals from my existing students, you know, because and it's not so much about their results at this point because we're just getting started, um, but it's about all that the benefits that they have traditionally not gotten in other programs, mm -hmm. you know, having access to, you know, like they get hung up on tech t resources and stuff like that. So, and, and so if you're thinking about this in the context, if you, if you are a digital company, you know, and you're training, teaching, whatever, you know, how can you over deliver to such a degree that it is a different experience for your students? If you could think about that, because I, yeah. I like to, plant those opportunities in your head. What are the possibles for you? Um, okay, Jay, where 
can everybody connect with you? I know everybody's wanting to know how to get your book. So do you have a place that you prefer them to get it or just go over to Amazon? Um, and then how no, can they connect with fun. you? Yeah, books easy to find, available all the ways you can get books, um, hardcover, uh, Kindle, audiobook read by myself and my co-author, Daniel. Uh, audiobook is really fun. We kept it uh, kind of light, and I think it's an interesting listen. Uh, one thing about the book, I should say, uh, the book itself has talk triggers. It would be ironic if it didn't. Number one, the book cover has alpacas on it, and it's hot pink. So if you see it in a store, you will definitely stand out. Uh, second, uh, the book itself has cards inside of it that you can rip out and give to somebody else as a recommendation. So it actually has a physical sort of word of mouth referral um, device inside the book. And then perhaps most importantly, uh, the book has a talk trigger and it says right on the, on the cover, if you don't love the book unconditionally, myself and Daniel will buy you any other book of your choosing. And that's absolutely true. We will buy you any book in the world if you don't like it uh, in exchange. And so far, we've only had two people take us up on that uh, of the many, many thousands and thousands and thousands of books we've sold. Two people have said, yeah, I don't like it. I want something different. And so we bought them something different. So no risk uh, if you want to grab talk triggers. You can connect with me, as it says on screen, at jbear.com. Also, uh, my core content now is I've got a, a newsletter. It comes out every two weeks. Uh, via emails called The Bear Facts. So if we go to thebearfacts.com, you can sign up for that. Each uh, issue of the newsletter has a customer experience, talk trigger, marketing lesson, a book review, a podcast review, uh, oftentimes a tequila review, and a bunch of other fun stuff. Awesome. So yes. It's actually The Bear Facts, Kim. Just I, okay, I have a quick story to, to tell um, around when you launched the book, I got the book, we're moving, as I shared with you earlier. So I'm like scrambling this morning trying to find my copy of it. You know, I don't know where it's at. It's in a box somewhere, I guess, already. Um, but um, when and I got it, I got um, and the alpaca um, as well. So the little stuffed animal, right? And so I have a Sophie. My Sophie is my little princess here. She's my fur baby. She totes that alpaca a lot of places, a lot of times. So she loves Hold on. the alpaca. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. I told you that I'm moving. And so I just yeah. found in my office a whole box, a whole nother box of these. So oh if you want God. a couple more, yes. let me know. I'll be happy to send them to you. Yeah, that would be awesome. She does love them. And now we have Max, who's we didn't have at the time. So he has always taken her stuffed toys from her. So he's like, I'll, I'll hook you he's, up. He's, uh, he really cover, just wants so to. So people think that the cover, people think the cover of the book is a llama. Uh, and it's yes. not, it's an alpaca. Uh, and so uh, if you go to talktriggers.com, which is the website for the book, talktriggers.com, uh, <laughs> so many people asked us about it. We had to commission an infographic which is the differences between llamas and alpacas. So we have a I full infographic. So, <laughs> you so can there is that um, as well. about just about a couple of miles down the road from my dad's house in Virginia is an alpaca farm. And so they oh, yeah. give like um, tours. I had the best time at this. They are the sweetest things. Oh, sweet. I was afraid they were going to spit at me because I think that's what the... Um, um, the other one does, but they were sweet. Yes. I loved it. We had so much fun. Um, anyway, llamas. Yes, they yes. are. They are so. yes. All right. Well, thank you, Jay, for spending time with My us pleasure. and dropping so many amazing value um, nuggets for us. Hopefully you guys can go out and fit, find your talk trigger and it doesn't, it, you know, just try, test it, figure out what's going to work for you. Um, but don't, do nothing. I think that's the moral to the story. Uh, figure out some way to love up your customer base um, and, you know, be, you know, showcase something different, unique, unexpected. I like that unexpected word. Um, so unexpected, thank you guys for it. being Send with me the us. Notes I want to see what you guys did with the notes. I want, I want the notes too. Yeah, absolutely. We'll do it. All right, guys, take care Thanks. of yourselves. Stay safe. God bless. And we'll see you next week. Same time, same place.